So, have you ever changed one part of your site and accidentally broke something else and didn't find out about it until it was already live and people were already hitting the problem? Who's, who's had that problem? Today? <laughs> no, not today. Has anyone ever gotten an unclear requirement from a client? Like you get the three pages of bullet points and you know you don't even know if you've done it or not. That, that definitely has <laughs> happened to us last Friday. <laughs> Have you ever asked uh, non-coders to help out with testing stuff, you know, put it on staging before you release it live and either they test a little bit and miss obvious problems or they just don't have time to do it? Yeah. If so, then automated testing like with BHAT could help make your life easier. You know, you could make changes with confidence that you aren't going to break something. Collaborate with your clients to make the tests be the acceptance criteria for their specification. I'll talk about this more later because it excites me terribly. But there's no ambiguity in a test. A test either passes or fails. And have you know a program, have the robots do it rather than humans because robots always have time and once properly trained never miss or forget anything. So automated testing is basically a list of steps to perform and the expected outcomes, but it's performed by a program, by a script. There's a lot of types of automated testing. Uh, here are some of the more common ones. Uh, who here in the room would say that they are a coder, would identify as a coder? How many of you have written unit tests? Sweet, you guys are awesome. Uh, <laughs> so unit tests are, um, tests of an individual unit of code, like an individual function or method in a program. It's a tool that programmers use while they are writing uh, the program. Integration tests are uh, similar, use some of the same tools, but it's testing units working together. Behavioral tests are sometimes called functional tests. That's when you're testing the website the way that a user would. So it's like load this page, click this link, fill in this field, click this button, and that is the type of testing that we're going to be talking about today. So all of these types of tests, unit tests, integration tests, behavioral tests, are usually written as code by coders. But that's not always the case. So BHAT is a tool to do behavioral testing. Um, it supports several different drivers, several <coughs> different ways of actually performing these tests. Uh, the simplest is a tool called Gout. So this pulls the web page down and then analyzes it. Like it looks for the links, clicks them by taking that link and then downloading the next page. On the other end of the spectrum, it can also use Selenium. Who's heard of Selenium? Sweet. So Selenium will actually load up a real browser and run the tests in a real browser. So uh, there's like a way to run Chrome headless so it'll start up Chrome and it'll still draw the window, but in memory it won't actually show it to you and it'll do all the clicking and all the JavaScript and stuff. But you can even test like IE. You can test IE6 in Selenium. And what you do is you set up a Windows machine that runs a special little Selenium server. And when you tell your tests to start, if you're sitting there looking at that Windows machine, you'll actually see a window of IE6 come up. You'll see, you know, the buttons get clicked, the fields get filled out and everything. And then you quickly close your eyes so that you don't have to see it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, yeah so uh, Gout runs way faster, so you try to use it when you can. Selenium is way more accurate, but it can take a really long time to run. So when you're, you know, making tests in BHAT, you'll say, well, these ones can be done in Gout, so do them there. Or maybe it's a sophisticated test that needs JavaScript, so you run it in Selenium. Uh, there's a in-between driver, uh, Zombie.js. It's a simulated web browser using Node.js. So it's real JavaScript, so you can test stuff that's in JavaScript, but there isn't a real browser. So it can run faster than Selenium. Uh, the main disadvantage is that it's not a very good simulation of a browser yet. Um, but there's lots more drivers. That's just some of the popular ones. The most interesting part about BHAT, though, because like you could totally use any of these tools right now without BHAT. Like I've written tons of behavioral tests uh, for Selenium and code. The thing that makes BHAT different is that the tests are written in human readable text files, not in code. 
So the tests read like a story, but then still can be executed automatically and verified automatically. This is totally a game changer. You know, non-coders can read and understand the tests, but not only that, non-coders can help write the tests. I mean, this isn't for everyone, obviously, but a bright person with an uh, analytical mindset, a detail-oriented mindset, totally could handle it. It's not rocket science. The biggest problem with automated testing is that you have no tests. You know, I think we all recognize that it's a good idea, that we should do it, that it would solve problems for us, not having to, you know, manually go click through and miss things or whatever. But we never seem to find the time to get them written. If we open this up not just to something that coders can do, but stakeholders who really care about the project can sit down and make the tests, maybe they'll actually get written. You know, if the stakeholder says, like, oh, last week you changed something and it broke this really important function, you can say, hey, go write a B hat test for that, and we'll never break it again. So if you have these human-readable tests that read as stories, your clients can read them and understand them. And if you can sell them on this idea, you could even get them to sign off on the tests as acceptance criteria for the project. So rather than having those pages of bullet points, you'd work with the client to create you know, a bunch of BHAT feature tests. They look at them and say, hey, that's how we want this to work. When the tests pass, that project is done. And I've never done that with a client. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really excited to try it. The next big project I get, I'm going to try it. Has, has anyone here ever done something like that? Use tests as acceptance criteria? We have used tests in the past as acceptance criteria, but there was a translation step. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a raw, this is the actual test. There was, let's go down the tests. Let's write use cases, then let's write tests. We got sign off on use case, which was <coughs> not the language of articulation to the to the testing process. Actual test very much, yeah. So how, how did that go, though, with the... It went really well. Um, awesome. This was with, like, enterprise Java, you know, application development stuff. Awesome. So who's heard of test-driven development? Has anyone ever done test-driven development? Sweet. Uh, so test-driven development is where you write your unit tests before writing the code that they test. So you're writing a test for a function that doesn't exist yet. So the test will fail, then you write the function, and then the <coughs> test passes. It's a discipline to write your tests, change your tests, and then change the code, rather than the other way around, with the goal of uh, making sure that all of your code has tests. So behavior-driven development is basically the same thing but for behavioral tests, writing your behavioral tests before creating the features that they are testing. Uh, Dan North is the guy who came up with behavioral driven development. Uh, What's in a story is one of the seminal articles about it in which he writes, uh, behavior driven development is an outside in methodology. It starts at the outside by identifying business outcomes and then drills down into the feature set that will achieve those outcomes. So, we're tech guys. We think features first. You know, uh, my website's going to have a blog. Why is it going to have a blog? All websites have blogs. How can I have a, a website without a blog? But, you know, it's a really good <coughs> exercise to start with. What are you trying to accomplish? Then turn that into uh, what features are necessary to accomplish that, and then breaking those features down into a series of steps. So this feature exists when you can click this, fill in this field, press send, and then that happens. So starting at the, the one outcome you want and then getting down to the details as opposed to the other way around. So we've been talking about BHAT feature specifications. What do they actually look like? So each of these text files, these feature text files, will start with a short narrative. Um, and this is sort of the suggested format in order to, as a role, I need to feature, putting the benefit first and the feature last. But this part actually isn't parsed by BHAT. It's just there to facilitate that everything in this file should exist to achieve that goal, to sort of set the, the tone. Here's an example. Uh, in order to communicate with potential customers as a site editor, I need to create blog posts. So starting with what we really want is to communicate, and that's how we're going to do it. Can you go back to the one right before this? Role feature. Thank you. <coughs> After
after that come a series of scenarios, and this is the part that's actually parsed by Behat, the part that actually does something. Uh, you set up some context. When I do this, and then this, and then this, then this outcome should occur, and that's what it checks. Here's an example. Uh, finding the add blog post form. So given that I'm logged in as a user with the editor role, and this line will actually cause bhat to create a new user and assign it the editor role. And then when the test is over, bhat will remove that user that just created. And then when I follow add content, that's telling bhat to click a link called add content, and then I follow blog post, click another link, then I should be on node add blog. So here it's checking where am I now, if it's that, we pass, if it's not, we fail. I know this is a really contrived test. If I was really writing this test, uh, I wouldn't just check that I was on the page. I would actually write the blog and then click save and see it post. But this fits on a slide and this is actually authentically executable. So, magic live demo time. What was the first step called? Um, the first step? So the, you mean like Feature a year in order to as I need to? That was called? The narrative? The narrative. That's it. So, hmm. hang on. <coughs> I, have get, I have to get to the right place first. Okay, so to help you get your bearings, let's look at that uh, feature spec in full, rather than broken across a bunch of slides. Oops, we're adding that later. Um, yeah, so it's pretty much the same as what was on the slides, uh, a little more verbose. Um, I adapted it to shrink the, the length on the slide. Does anyone have any questions? Is the, um, is the language of test expression I follow, I should be on? Those are phrases that we learn. There's a, there's a dictionary of those expressions that we need to follow. I should be on mm -hmm. equals, check URL is, et cetera. Yes, I, I will show that uh, in a slide or two. Cool. So we will actually execute this. You can see it do each step. That all worked out. And that scenario passed. It was able to execute it, it was done, it worked. Four steps, six steps. Um, are yeah. you using the gout method for this? Yes, okay. this is with gout. I don't have Selenium set up. That would have been a much cooler demo, though. I should have done that. Uh, so bhat knows what to do from this bhat.yaml file. You say, my features are in a directory called features. Uh, you tell it, you know, I want the mink extension because we're testing a web app. Uh, bhat's actually not written to be specific to web applications. bhat just provides the language parsey bits. It could also conceivably test GUI applications, uh, command line applications, whatever. So mink is the part that tells it that we're testing a web app. I'm loading the gout driver, I'm loading the selenium driver, the, test, the site we're testing is here at uh, bhat mvb creator.dev. We're loading the Drupal extension. Uh, and the Drupal extension has a couple of drivers of its own. Uh, you could actually point bhat at a site you don't own. Like I could tell bhat to go test google.com if I wanted. Uh, and that would be through the black box driver. All it has is the web browser. Um, but if you want to do some of the more sophisticated rules to your site, uh, you need to have some more tight drivers like uh, the Drush driver uh, in this feature spec. This rule, given I'm logged in a user, uh, as a user with the editor role, um, if I was just using the black box driver, that wouldn't work. Uh, it needs the Drush driver to actually create that user. And there's other rules like creating a, a node, creating a taxonomy, all this stuff that requires having access to uh, an API driver, which is what that tag's about. If I remove that, this test will fail. You ever run into a problem with like your something would work under Drush, maybe, and mm -hmm. wouldn't work in the browser. So you pass all your tests, but something that doesn't work. That totally can happen. That's what I was thinking, so. Yeah, but I mean. So if you have somebody sign out for these things, mm -hmm. like that would be kind of not great. The, the purpose of this particular test, though, isn't to test, can we create a user with the editor role? Like, that's just part of the given context. Yeah. So if I was testing creating users, 
I would, you know, step through that, the actual go through the admin screens and stuff. So the API access is mostly about setting up a context and sometimes about verifying something that you can't see on the web page. So the API also is what inherits the specific vocabulary for the test articulation, right? It's the, the API is what's telling you have to talk Drupal language. Is that the case? Because you said it could be used for any... Mm -hmm. So the, the Drupal extension that we're loading has a whole bunch of rules for uh, Drupal-specific stuff. Okay. Um, or steps, not rules. Um, we'll cover that, though. Okay. We'll even go over how to create our own steps and stuff. Okay. <coughs> Um, uh, has anyone heard of Composer? No? Uh, it's a PHP tool for downloading PHP dependencies. Anyway, uh, the install is really simple via, via Composer, but we're going to look at that last. To break from the tradition of installing first, we're going to install last. So to James's question, where do the steps come from? Uh, we can run in b hat dash, dash di and it gives us all of the step definitions and there's some pretty cool stuff in here um, wow. and you'll notice they're regular expressions not natural language parsing or anything sophisticated but so when I see things like you know I'm seeing or I'm viewing and it's running that regular expression across the whole content of the page so wherever my theme might be sending an error message it'll still so Yes, when you say when I'm seeing, that's, that's just uh, uh, scanning the page, but there are things in here for checking for something in a specific region. Okay. There are steps for checking for error messages in particular. Um, we'll mess this up so we can look around. Yeah, I should not see the error message containing text or um, I should see the following error message or I should see the success message containing Blah. Yeah, I click uh, for field name, I enter value. I, probably this is a little weird to read for people who don't understand regular expressions. Is anyone totally confused? Just as an example, like this, um, this rule, when you used it, would actually look something like Given for name, I enter David. Like that's how that would actually look if you used it in the file. And if I were collaborating with someone who was a non coder, I would take all of those definitions and put them on a page somewhere and clean up the regexes so they don't look like gibberish. Um, I would definitely not ask a non coder to be running stuff on the command line, but this, this is the quickest way to get there. So where do those rules all come from, or steps all come from? Uh, the B hat uh, Drupal extension has a lot of cool stuff just for Drupal. We saw a lot of it in there. Also, any modules that you have installed on your site can create a module name.bhat.inc file which contains custom steps. So rather than having to always compose your tests out of like the basic units you get, you can have steps specifically for a module. Like uh, if it's a slideshow module, you could have you know, something where it's, I see a slideshow with slides, apple, orange, and banana, and it would have a built-in <coughs> step that would help you do that easier with fewer steps. And uh, locally, you can create as many steps as you want uh, by putting them into this features bootstrap feature context file. This is where we're going to get codery, so I apologize to any of the non-coders here, but I, I think it's useful just to see, to see how easy Behat makes this for us. So when you want to add, and I wrote a rule in my thing, jeez, spontaneous, uh, okay, so if you want to create a new step, all you have to do the first thing is just start using it. Uh, so long as you use the step consistently and follow best practices for the naming, 
putting your arguments in quotations, making them be like, I see, whatever sort of style phrases, it's totally easy for the coder to add later, so long as you use it consistently. So let's try it. So we'll make a new scenario. So I just made that up. But we could, you know, create our own step that creates a bunch of example blog con blog contact content. to run bhat, it'll first run our previous test, which is going to totally succeed. And then it'll come back with this one undefined step, and it will give us the code in order to define that step. And uh, actually, I'll go off my original plan here. Um, if you put things in quotes, it'll even give you a sane uh, regular expression to do the argument. So about something, argument arg1. So it totally hooks you up with the code to make it really easy for the coders to implement these steps after the non-coders have just invented them. And bhat goes uh, even further than just telling you what the code is. We can get it to, run, to write the code for us. Um, you'll see that the file where we put our own custom rules doesn't exist. I don't have it. It should go in features bootstrap feature context.php. So step A, I asked bhat to create that for me. So now I have a features bootstrap feature context. Because we're doing um, because we're doing the Drupal extension, we have to make a slight change to it. This change is written on my slide, so later if you want to come back and try this yourself, uh, shouldn't have any problems. But we're, we're not using the standard bhat context, we're using a special Drupal context. And it's you know already in stubbed out with some example code. So now if I wanted it to say, hey bhat, just put all of the undefined rules that you showed me here into my file, add the pen snippets argument, And now if I go look at my feature context file, you see that there is already the beginning of a rule. It's got the regular expression already for me and the PHP function ready for me to just start implementing that. <coughs> so in practice, the bhat feature creation workflow will look something like this. You start writing features with existing rules when possible. You can easily get a list of everything that's there for your particular site, because it'll vary depending on what modules are installed. If you need a new step uh, to simplify your features, just start using it. Like I said, if you do it consistently, follow best practices, we just saw how easy it was for the coder to add support for it later. Uh, the situations where you want to create a new step uh, is these, really. Uh, fewer steps is better. If suddenly you have a dozen tests that are 30 steps long, your tests stop looking like a readable story and start looking like computer code. If you can't browse through there and easily distinguish, you know, this one's doing this and this one's doing that, you know, you, you need to do some simplification. And you do that just by making up new steps that fit better with the story. If you see a lot of uh, series of steps duplicated, like all of your tests have these same three steps you know, moved all around them, you know, make up a new step that combines those three. It's really legalization rules. Yeah, really if someone, if an, a non-technical, non-coder person can't sit down and understand it as a story, then you're doing something wrong. 
and it's super easy for the coder to add new steps later. So it's this really cool parallel workflow. Like the non-coders can work on their own over here. Uh, whenever the coders get time, they can jump in and add their steps, and they shouldn't need to communicate too much. You know, if the non-coders make them consistently, the coders are set. If they read like stories, they should be obviously understandable what they're supposed to be doing. So the, the non-coders will create steps that don't work. Right. And then the coders come by later and make them work. Right. Okay. And so long as the coders have a, a they've been trained up on BHAT and understand the best practices and that stuff, it should work out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, as long as the, the non-coders realize that we're creating these questions, these, these tests that aren't, they're not gonna work until, until somebody mm -hmm. fills in the blanks for them. Right, or likely some of them will work, but then others yeah. won't. And they'll know when a test doesn't exist because you'll have given them the big master list of, of oh. all the steps. So, so those will work. Right, right. The new ones that won't work. Okay. Right. So so long as you know they understand how it works and they follow the document, they can use you know the existing ones when they have them, and then when they need to simplify to make these the things read better as stories, they can make up new steps without needing to ask a coder for permission first. Right. They won't work until the coder fixes them. Right. Okay. So we were saying steps here. That refers to like a line where it says like I'm logged in as such and such and yep. I do this. Anything that starts with the word given, when, or then okay. is a step. And those all are a regular expression that connects to a PHP function. So it's super simple. And then you have access to uh, you know, the Drupal API, or if you access to Drush, or whatever you need to do to actually make that happen. <coughs> so, installation, here at the end. Um, a really quick way to get started. Uh, this, the, is your, this is your last thing? Not my last, last thing. Oh, cool, okay, because I just want to ask you a quick question. I'm sorry. So, no, yeah, ask, yeah. So, um, I just don't get it because I this it just seems like a lot of extra work. Like you know the communication thing, and I, I appreciate that, but I I can't see writing things high level enough that won't necessitate a bunch of extra like busy work. You know, I and maybe I need it like better. You know, like a more concrete example mm -hmm. that applies to Drupal. But you know, like you you gave the blog example of one, but you never write that. Right, because you'd, you'd make a more of a complicated test. You'd yeah. want to... And so would an end user even have that requirement most of the time without getting too into the weeds? You know, I don't know. I'm saying a bunch of mm -hmm. things. So oh, I, I, we don't think of that, because I can imagine if your app has a bunch of device ID specific stuff, would you have really elaborate tests? Like, would it be... Well, here's the thing. Like, at this point, I'm... I'm strapped for time as it is, just building the features of it. So right. I haven't written a single test yet. Um, you know, I look at you know Drupal has uh, like PHP simple tests. Simple tests. Yeah. So you know, I'm looking into that as kind of like a future thing. Maybe if I'm working with like other, like you know, we get the guys like upstairs to work with us too. There's a bunch of us. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll fill that in there. But um, yeah, I mean, it just seems you know. Testing in general is hard to do when you're already strapped for time. You know, writing tests is hard to do when you're strapped for time. Absolutely. Just writing the base features, you know? Yeah, that, that's really the, the fundamental so, thing. So the, the tests all take an investment in time and maintenance, because now you have more things in your project, right? And hopefully they provide a value uh, as well. And hopefully the value exceeds the time and maintenance investment. So generally, if you have tests for like the most important things in your app, you get the most like value for time spent testing, because those are the things you don't want to break, you know? And then if you, I don't know, sort of add tests as things break or add tests as you find problems, it can, it can easily, even without like complete test coverage, replace human testers. Because when, when you like just made a new whole bunch of code, you're about to take it live, you say, hey team, go test it. Like, how in-depth do they really test it, you know? It doesn't take that many tests to at least equal what a human manual tester generally does. And if you could just take them out of the equation and maybe go a little bit further, there is value. But you, you do have to balance it with the time it takes to create. Like, I'm looking at this, and like the big value I see here is that, you know, as a, as a coder, I can just write a couple steps, 
and the users actually write the test, so yeah. I don't have to do all that. So yeah. that's that's what I see as being the value for BHAP. <laughs> I think I think if you may want to think about this at a different level and figure forget about this being a website and think about module development. Right. Where you're actually, you know, for me, the we just got through talking about this talk. User stories are not, you know, this is from a web perspective. If you wanted to test modular code, this is available in PHP, it's available in Java. So when you start creating user stories and you start creating scenarios, it's more about capturing requirements. If, if I didn't do any of this automated testing, I'd still do the other part, because it's hugely, hugely beneficial. I completely agree. I mean, it, I can easily imagine working through this with a customer in a facilitated business meeting with the users to get them to articulate the, the comfort of them walking out of that discussion mm -hmm. and knowing that I could turn to Dave and be like, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. There will be no need for further clarification is immensely valuable and saves a whole bunch of other people in the workflow time and money. Like, right. The mobile, the mobile example that we just did with the client, we had Drupal site, we wanted it to be responsive on certain classes of mobile devices and not others. And we were feeling <coughs> the themes in each one. Mm -hmm. We could have used a test to eliminate the, did we get it right on the iPhone and not the Android, because the customer had these weird, you know, if my mom was wearing a blue shirt yesterday, then show the responsive theme on Android kind of rules. It would have been great <laughs> to have, you know, a test for that. And then we wouldn't have to think of it. And I can see, uh, right along those lines, if if you got a complicated site, and in any time that I might go to add a feature or change something, and then I I have to go and check around and see if everything else is still working. And so I've broken things where it's taking me a long time to figure out what caused it. But if I could just if I could have these tests already ready, like I know I want to make sure this feature works after I work on add something else, I can do my work and then run. I can go back to this and run tests. I don't have to go through clicking around seeing if I broke something. And I'm frequently logging in as different user levels mm -hmm. on my own site to see what if it's working for each each one. Mm -hmm. And that is very time consuming. Yeah, the mm -hmm. the that's, that's true. I don't know. I like I'm trying to quantify in my head like how much faster that would be doing those things and making sure that like making sure that I, I do catch all of the Things that I actually want to be. Yeah, you don't have to test everything. I would no, right, yeah. right, but I feel like I might miss something if I'm like writing some of the. I don't know. Yeah, I'm probably. Once I'm coding, I can't think like like a like a, a tester. I mean, like a, like a user. Yeah. And I have to get out of the coding brain. How you write the user brain? Yeah. If you're not thinking like a user, how can you write your requirements or your? Scenario? No, once you once I'm in the coding. Yeah. Once that I'm makes sense. Make, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this would give me a, 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 a point and click or a, a command line way of running a bunch of tests that I thought about last week and I actually wrote them last week. So now I can just do it, done, go back to what I'm focused on. So I can see all sorts of different levels of... I'm seeing it as a good way of disciplining the, the users that you're having the conversation with because they can see it in plain English and get their own requirements straight in their head instead of sort of saying vague things and hoping that you're going to catch it in the PHP coding, which they think is magic anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I could imagine at the top of that, that, you said the text at the header is whatever, really. It's just for yeah. us to. Yeah. So, I mean, I could put a dollar amount in the contract mm -hmm. right there. Be like, right. this costs X, and you know, yeah. when <laughs> you see it do that, give us the money, and it's right. all contained inside of that one thing. <laughs> so, yeah, nice. And once you have it down to that too, you could like have B hat generate a report for you every day that has a big progress bar. Twelve percent of the tests are passing tomorrow. Fifteen percent of the right. tests are passing. Great. <laughs> yeah, to, to the original uh, point, um, behavior-driven development is an extreme. In the same way that test-driven development is an extreme for unit testing, um, I just think it's really cool with the client intersection. You know, when you're pressed for resources, pressed for time, you totally have to make those pragmatic decisions. You know, is my time better spent here or better spent developing? That said, I think you can get a ton of value without going the full behavior-driven development thing, just a handful of well, tests. One like thing I can see working is you have a, uh, a client, you have a sales guy, and you, I, I can totally see that working because, you know, sales guy says, oh, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 and then you can say, you have to write the test for that. I, that I totally buy. <coughs> uh, and uh, yeah, 
I intend to put that to use at some point. But um, <laughs> if so talking directly to clients <laughs> and you have to write out these things, no. here's the vocabulary that might be tough. But do it do it as part of discovery. You yeah, know, sure. it, it's still not everyone can write these types of tests because, yeah. and not that like some people are stupid and some people are smart, no. but just that sort of analytical, systematic, step by step mindset. I could I just feel like a lot of them would say that's not paying you to do. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you, you get the test writer in the yeah. room, you get a facilitator from your side, and then a bunch of people from the client, and the facilitator draws things out, the test writer's banging away. I mean, I think yeah. it, could, it could work as part of discovery. I don't know. Um, I, if anyone tries that, I'm really excited to hear how it goes. And I'm totally going to try and do it next big project I get, uh, and I'll let you guys know. I'm not an answer, I just had questions. No, and they're totally valid questions because it is, it is an extra investment to create tests. But I think if you focus on the highest business value tests first and then work your way down, or another thing that a lot of people do when there are no tests is every time you fix a bug, write a test for that. That's what I was thinking with so my then, example. Yeah, you only ever fix each bug once, you know? Yeah, that's true. For mission critical stuff, I see a big application here. I just like, it really does cost a lot of money. Yeah, so you guys interested in doing the install? It's super simple. What platform is it on? What's that? We're, we're doing install it uh, into your Linux? Yeah, I was going to install it on the same machine we've been testing on. Okay. Um, but the, the easiest uh, way to do this at home, if you want to, uh, this link will take you to uh, the VHAM directory and MVP creator, which is where we've been doing all this stuff now, which has like a nice readme file and all the configuration already created. So you can just copy it and follow the four steps in the readme file, and you can be set for your own installation. Otherwise, the Drupal VHAM extension has like a 10-step process that does the exact same thing, but you would be doing them all manually. Um, so we'll just do it real quick here. Uh, let me first delete it so we can reinstall it. Something funny is running in the background. So, like I said earlier, this will be installed via Composer. And Composer reads this composer.json file, uh, which this is the simplest composer.json ever. Um, it's saying we require the Drupal B hat extension, which has all of its dependencies specified in its package, and it'll just download all that, including B hat and everything. Uh, and we're saying to install applications into the bin directory. That's why I was typing bin slash B hat. So first, we need Composer. Look at the readme, and I can just copy the commands right out of here. This one will uh, download Composer. These steps are in your VHAT directory? Yep, in the readme file that you'll find there. So uh, I'll put this presentation uh, into the, the meetup.com group, and you can go in there and follow the link. Apparently, the internet here is not the fastest. So now we have Composer, it's this um, composer.far file. Fars are like uh, the equivalent of Java jars or uh, Python eggs. It's just like a zip file with a bunch of PHP code in it that you can run. Uh, to tell Composer to just install everything that it finds in the composer.json, this is what's going to do all the actual work. You will see it download like 20 things once the Wi Fi kicks in. Only I had a spinning beach ball to distract you. Oh, here we go. Or an hourglass. <laughs> or an hourglass. <laughs> some great high-level stuff about behavior-driven development, why you should do it, what value it provides. It 
It also has some advice on uh, how to write good tests, you know, what a test should include, what a test shouldn't include. Uh, if you're interested in, in getting deeper into this, I highly recommend it. Behat.org has some good docs. Uh, some of the docs you'll need, though, you'll find with the Mink extension, because that's the thing that makes Behat test web apps, which is what you're going to be doing. Uh, the Drupal Behat extension uh, has lots of good documentation as well. Uh, this was created by the Drupal.org team to facilitate the uh, Drupal.org D6 to D7 uh, migration. They sat down to do this, like, I don't know, two years ago or three years ago or something, and said, well, how the hell are we going to test a site this big, you know, migrating everything from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7? So the first thing they did was make a huge Behat test suite. Which you, if you want to see an example of a huge Behat test suite, you can find it right here. Uh, the project is called Doobie. It's a gigantic list of Behat feature specs. Oh my god. Well, we'll see if this finishes by the end of the evening. <laughs> but once it gets going, it'll just say downloading you know, each of Behat's dependencies, and eventually it'll be there. So, any additional questions? Are there any weirdnesses with things like, uh, I don't know, some of the stuff that we use, for example, when Atrium uses Ajax, or uses other mm -hmm. things that take time to happen in the interface that I'm going to be testing? And some of them require a web browser too. You know, even if you have a fake browser, it won't necessarily do like simultaneous connections the same way or right. finish downloading things in the same order. Um, so to do those types of tests, you have to use the Selenium driver. And uh, it's a beautiful tool. I've written tons of Selenium tests directly for Selenium in code. Because like all those tools, Gout, Selenium, ZombieJS, they're designed to be used independently uh, as well as, you know, uh, but Selenium does does great stuff. There's actually a cloud service. I've seen that. I can't remember the name of it. Sauce Labs. Sauce Labs. They have a whole. They have like just a ton of machines and different devices running Selenium on them. You buy an account and you can tell Behat to use the Selenium on their servers. And you can like load up a browser on an iPhone and then click through the browser on the iPhone. You can like old. Internet Explorer 5 on a Mac or whatever you need to test, they just have arrays of computers there and you, I don't know how you pay them uh, per request or machine time or something. So, so it, oh, in Drupal, when you're testing, uh, like the example where you needed a user with a certain role, does, you're saying that in the background it'll create the user and then delete the user? Yes. Now, users have ID numbers. Mm -hmm. Does it revert back, or do you end up using up ID numbers? Uh, so you should never do uh, functional tests on your production site unless you've written them specifically to run on your production site, okay. and then you you know take those considerations into example. But you should be doing this on a dev or a staging server where you don't worry about the ID numbers and you can wipe out the data and recreate it, all that stuff. So it w it will it will build the ID numbers. And yep. <laughs> and if you have a step that misbehaves, it can leave stray data on your site. Uh, so, uh, you can set up Behat to work with a continuous integration server as well. So, like as soon as you commit to Git, it'll like create a new site, do a new install, run all of your Behat tests, and then destroy it, uh, which is a common way to use it as well. So, you, you definitely should not run uh, behavioral tests on a site that you expect to keep living. Okay. Any other questions? So maybe this is what you were asking before, well, it, but have you ever used Behat before you actually created the site? Have you used Behat in the course of designing the requirements for the site? I, I plan to. It uh, sounds for excellent. MVP creator. Yeah. Uh, and I know everyone. Some people are new here anyway. MVP creator is an idea for a Drupal distribution that I have, uh, where it's geared to helping you get the basics of a minimal viable product up really, really fast. And it doesn't exist yet. It's just a concept I've been telling everyone I see about. Uh, and there's a project on Drupal.org and like a tiny bit of code for it. Uh, but it would be really cool to say like, well, what are the features we need for MVP creator to make that actually work? And like sit down and have like a feature writing sprint. So 
one of the ideas I wanted to propose to you guys for the sprint, we could do a testing sprint if uh, it seemed like this was an interesting topic to you guys. If it's not, we'll do a different type of sprint. But um, I just want to throw the idea out there because it's something that non-coders can uh, easily do. I'd love to do it for Panoply and MVP Creator, but if you have your own project that you want to make tests for, that's totally cool. So long as we're all in the room working on BHAT tests, then the sprint will work. We'll be able to collaborate, share ideas, help each other out. Um, so yeah. It would be how cool to do it all in one session and be like, okay, here's the test, fresh off the press. You know, I mean, that would be really kind of fun to walk through the whole workflow with different people in each position. Yeah, I, I, uh, when Len and uh, Lowell and I did the startup weekend, it was just really cool. Like, we're always here talking and presenting and stuff, and that's fun. But to, like, actually sit down and, like, do some, some real work, that was a lot of fun. And I'd like to start doing that with the, the group in some capacity. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you.